service, inviting God in to be working. I think you guys know this song pretty well. We've done it a lot. So sing with us. Let's worship together.
give life an eternal spark. I call you healer. You can mend any broken heart. I call you faithful father. Cause you finish everything you start. My soul is made. Give Jesus some praise in here. Come on, guys. Amen. 
Uh, let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much, God, that we can come into this place and we can remind ourselves of who you are and just your wonder and your majesty, Lord. Um, there is no way to sufficiently describe you with words, God. But we come here this morning with grateful hearts, expectant hearts, and we pray, Lord, that you would be lifted up uh, in this place, in this room, in our hearts today. And we offer this service to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dunwoody Community Church. Look around, find somebody that you don't know, and give them a warm welcome. Okay, go ahead and take a seat. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Dunwoody Community Church. My name is Tim. I'm one of your pastors here. And uh, it's good to see everybody this morning. If this is your first time here or second or third and we don't know who you are, we would love to know who you are. You can let us know by either scanning that QR code. By the way, the screens are back up. Yay. And Jared and Yolandi are married. There they are back there. Jared, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm distracted. Jared heard what I said last week about give him a big bear hug, and that's why he's completely secluded from everybody, and you won't see him after the service today, but congratulations to you guys. Um, if it is your first time or first few times, scan that QR code. We'd love to have your name, email address, and phone number, or you can grab one of the Connect cards in front of you and drop it in one of the offering boxes on your way out. Um, so a couple things I want to let you know about. First of all, this Wednesday... This coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. here in this room, we're going to gather to pray together, whoever can make that. We're praying for what the Lord has in store for us, what's next for us as a church. We want to seek the Lord together for that. So if you're available Wednesday from 7 until about 8 o'clock, I want to invite you to come back here to the church. Um, something really, really fun we're going to do this morning is I'm going to ask Becky Terry to come on up here. Everybody give it up for Becky. And you know, Becky, I'm not going to set this up because this is just so exciting what you're about to share. I'm going to let you share with everybody, okay? So here you go. All right. Good morning. So I got through both of my parents' eulogies. Let's see if I can get through this without crying this morning. How many of you have a knack for dates? Not very many. Well, my dad had a tremendous ability to remember dates. He could remember that he got a hot dog on July 11th, 1938 in, on Penn Street in Reading, Pennsylvania for a dime. I did not inherit that gene. I remember very few dates. But one of the dates I do remember is August 25th, 1974. That was the first day I walked through the steps of Dunwoody Community Church. Now, it, at that time, it was meeting down at Vanderlyn Elementary School down the road. And my name had been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, freshly inked for seven days. So, fast forward, and if you're good with the math, Today is my 50th anniversary of attending my beloved DCC. Thank you, but I'm up here to give glory and thanks to God, first and foremost, for revealing himself to me when I was looking for the answers to life, to letting me know that he is the one true God, the savior of my sins, and giving me great inner peace and joy. I also want to publicly give thanks to God for the gift of my spiritual home of DCC to express my gratitude for all that DCC has meant in my life and my family's life. Tim Crater, the founding pastor, heeded God's call to move from his home state of California to come to Atlanta, Georgia, and plant a church, then a sleepy southern town, city. Um, Tim's obedience to that call results in where we are sitting today. Tim fed us week after week, teaching us and guiding us from God's word, just as Jeff does today. 
how blessed I have been to be able to learn and grow from sound biblical teaching all of these years. Our children's spiritual foundation was laid and grounded and nurtured at DCC. They were baptized at a DCC family retreat and this was not orchestrated, but can you guess the date? August 25th, 2022. And now most recently, our grandson accepted Jesus into his heart at VBS in June. It has been a joy to participate in many areas within DCC over the years, from singing in the choir when we had a choir to being back in the children's wing, uh, teaching Sunday school, serving in the nursery, being on the missions team, getting to go to Ukraine, um, praying for DCC and those in our midst, attending ladies' Bible studies, joining a small group, sewing dresses for orphan girls in India, planning retreats, being in the women's ministry, cleaning toilets during the lean years, and if you can imagine, even worshiping through interpretive dance, sometimes with streamers. <laughs> Being involved in those various areas of uh, DCC was the catalyst for providing me with many wonderful friendship, friendships. My deepest and most abiding friendships have resulted from my fellowship at DCC. These friendships are treasures beyond riches. And I want to give a shout out to two of my closest friends who actually started, uh, as are having their 50th anniversary this year as well. And they started back in June of 1974. And they are Carolita Morrow and Bunny Bagley. And because of health issues, they have not been able to attend regularly but their heart is etched with love for DCC as well. My hope in telling you all this is that what has held true for me, I want to be encouraging to you. May I encourage you to be bold in your faith. I am beyond grateful that my roommate, Beverly Curran, was bold enough to share the gospel with me and then invite me to her church 50 years ago. One conversation and one invitation can change a person's life and future generations as well. Who can you share the gospel with? Who can you invite to church? I would also like to encourage everyone, young and old, to embrace all that DCC offers. Because of my personal experience, I firmly believe by being involved within the community, you will be abundantly blessed as I have been. I won't go into the history of DCC, but I liken uh, being involved and committed in a church body with that of a marriage. There are ups, and downs and ins and outs. And if we hang tight <clears throat> to what is good, in this case, Jesus and his word, our lives are fully enriched with all that God has planned for us. When our girls, Sarah Beth and Meg, were of youth group age, things were sparse. We had a revolving door of uh, youth pastors and volunteers. And I think at one point, the core group was my two girls and one other girl. But we hung in there. And our then pastor, Jim Ryder, traveled to Chicago to Divinity, um, no, Trinity Divinity School to interview for uh, a youth pastor for us. And I remember vividly that morning as I was driving the girls to school and praying about those interviews. The sun was just coming up, and I felt a great peace in the Lord telling me he was going to provide. His name was Ray Medina, 
and Ray had a profound influence on my girls, their spiritual growth, and he grounded them, um, he nurtured them, and uh, built the relationship with God. They went off to college, they served for many years with Young Life, and Meg went on to be a missionary in East Asia. The DCC youth group flourished, and then we got another great guy, um, Brian Marvel, and he actually officiated Sarah Beth and Dexter's um, wedding. And if you wondered if Stephen got a haircut today, that was my son-in-law playing the drums. <laughs> That's Dexter. So um, anyway, had we bailed out when the when it was tough and the the pickings were slim, and things were hard, what would my family have? missed out on. So my encouragement is to hang tight when things get tough. Again with the marriage analogy, we may not always agree with our spouse, we may not always agree with all the decisions that are made at our church, but as long as the church remains doctrinally sound with God-fearing elders who pray and seek his will, if it's at all possible, and I know there are myriads and myriads of reasons why it is not possible. Life happens. There's no judgment. Life circumstances change every day. But if it's at all possible, I am saying, by relying on prayer and always seeking God's will, I highly recommend staying the course. Pardon my repetition, but being a part of DCC for the past 50 years has given me some of life's richest blessings. Therefore, great joy. The joy that I have from being a member of DCC, I want for you and for everyone that walks through those doors. 50 years, Jubilee in the Bible, was a time of emancipation of, sl of slaves, debts absolved, and restoration of land. 50 years ago, I was freed from being a slave to sin. My sin debt was paid by Christ's death on the cross, and I was restored to my proper place in which to walk, the kingdom of God, bringing me out of the kingdom of darkness. Since biblical time, the word jubilee morphed into the Latin jubilare, to shout for joy and a season of rejoicing. And now, is associated with 50th anniversaries. In biblical times, they blew a ram's horn to indicate the 50th year. I contemplated getting a shofar, but <laughs> I had a feeling I would sound like a sick cow. I also uh, thought you did not want to see a 71-year-old up here dancing with rimmed streamers, but, <laughs> but in my spirit, I am blowing the ram's horn and dancing and I am celebrating with great joy, rejoicing in my Jubilee year here at DCC. May you also know that joy, whether it be 49, 39, 29, 19, or nine years. So again, all glory to God and his marvelous gift of salvation. And I thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Dunwoody Community Church from the bottom of my heart, both as a whole and, indiv and every individual who has touched my life through DCC. God bless you all, and God bless Dunwoody Community Church. <laughs> Rut row. <laughs> Okay, I didn't tell you, it was also, well, the 50 years ago, it was also my 21st birthday. I was trying to get that out because I knew Tim would be up to something. Well, you said something about a joyful noise, so uh, <laughs> we, we have heard it's also, but by the way, let's really, let's stand up and, and give her a big hand for, for God's faithfulness. Thank you for being such an example, Becky. And we did hear that it's your birthday, so um, I brought out what could be more fun that we're going to sing happy birthday together.
Becky, seriously, thank you so much for that testimony. That was, that, that was amazing. Now, try to be serious. Uh, pay no attention to this accordion around, around my neck. We have one more thing that we want to do here. Um, Terrell, you got your team here with you today? Your Guatemala team, going to bring them up. Uh, these guys are about to head to Guatemala this Saturday. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for, for you guys. I'm going to pray for you guys. Then I'm going to hand you the mic, and you can pray for Jeff, who's going to bring, bring the word today, okay? All right, let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much. Um, wow, what a great testimony, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. And I know that um, Becky's heart is for you to receive all the glory, and we do give you all the glory for this, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness to this church and for your faithfulness to all the people who have benefited from the word being taught, um, just the full counsel of God being taught here, of worship happening in spirit and truth, of community uh, happening, relationships that go through the years, Lord. We are so grateful for that. We're so grateful for Becky and her example um, of someone who has been here at this church through the years, through many changes and many different seasons, um, and we give you all the glory for this. And Lord, thank you that we can represent you not only here in Dunwoody, Sandy Springs, but also all around the world. And um, Lord, I pray for, for the team that's going out. Um, pray for the PAX and for, and for Terrell as he leads uh, a, a team with other people on it as well, Lord, this next week. We pray for safety for them. We pray that you would use them to minister to the people in the region where they're going. And we pray that the way that they love on these people and serve them would be a representation of the way that you came to serve and not to be served, Lord. So I pray for blessings on them. We commit them to you. We can't wait to hear great things that you have done, Lord, and we commit them to you in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the chance to, to gather. Lord, we thank you for Becky's testimony. Um, Lord, we thank you for the goofiness of, a, of an accordion and the fact that we can, we can laugh, we can smile, we can, we can love each other this morning. Lord, we thank you for the chance to hear your word. And, and Lord, as we, as we look at this topic of Acts and that they were sent, and Lord, you reminded us every week that we are sent. And so as we hear your word this morning, Lord, just like Becky had a day of August 25th, Lord, what, 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 what will this date hold for, for those of us to get to hear your word this morning, have a chance to respond to it? Will this day mean something else to us besides just coming into a sanctuary hearing a sermon and going home. So remind us today that discipleship is, is oh, it begins with, with knowledge, but Lord, it completes itself in obedience. So Lord, free our hearts and our minds to you. Blank out the rest of our day, the rest of our week. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Speak through your servant, Jeff. Lord, we want to hear from you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. While you're doing that, thank you, Becky, for not having any pictures of your present pastor when you met him and he was in middle school. So, um, yes, we have, we, I, 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 I was rocking the, the wavy, curly hair myself. So, um, Acts chapter 2 is perhaps, you could make a case, that it is one of like the top two or three most significant events in the Bible. If you're just going to line up, what are the biggies? What are just the massively important things in the Bible? Acts chapter 2 is way, way up there. It is the birthday of the church. We're going to sing it. After we finish my sermon, one of the songs we're singing is called King of Kings. And the, the last verse begins that the church of Christ was born and the Spirit lit the flame. And that's, that's this chapter. It's a chapter that they write songs about. This chapter is the culmination of a thousand years of prophecy. Since the time of David in a thousand BC, God has been saying that whereas up until then God's spirit was something that was given to people just for a specific task and a specific time. So the spirit of God comes upon Samson and he tears the Philistines apart and he destroys their army and then it leaves. Because the Spirit of God can't stay long-term with people. God can't be around people. Starting in the Garden of Eden, from when Adam and Eve disobeyed. You know, that's, so that's this part of the Bible right here. All of that, and all of that, God could not 
get close to people. Moses asked God, and Moses is one of God's best friends, one of his greatest servants. Moses asked God, can I see your glory? And God says, I'll make my goodness pass in front of you. Because God's glory is his goodness. But he says, I'm going to have to put a mountain between you and me. Because if you saw my goodness, you'd die. And most, God's not mad at Moses. Moses didn't do anything wrong. God doesn't want to hurt Moses. It's just if people and God get together, people will die. Because God's so good. God's goodness will kill us. God says, okay, but I'm going to have to hide you in a mountain and cover you so you don't die. You know, I worked in a hospital when I was in college. I was a nurse's aide. So, you know, I'm going in and taking blood pressures and filling out forms and asking questions and just all sorts of normal general stuff that happens every day in a hospital ward. And normally, you know, I'd, I'd just walk in. How are you feeling today, Mrs. Smith? Let me get your blood pressure. How are we doing? It's just a general med ward, people recovering from sicknesses. But we had occasionally, we'd have people who were immunocompromised, which meant that things that didn't bother me at all would kill them. So I had to wash up and mask up and suit up and go in to take Mrs. Smith's blood pressure if she was severely immunocompromised. Because stuff that's just, no, you know, you've got viruses and bacteria. You breathe stuff in and your body just swats it away. But wow, if I breathe that out to her, it could kill her. And that's what it's like for us and God. We are so severely, spiritually compromised that if God's goodness comes near us, we'll die. And that ends in Acts chapter 2. There is no barriers between God and men in Acts chapter 2. God's spirit can reside with mankind again. His goodness won't kill us anymore after what Jesus has done. What happened 50 days before this, the death and resurrection of Christ? Like this chapter is so, so important. The coming of the Holy Spirit, God residing with people. And I say all that to you as I read this chapter. I'm gonna read the whole thing. We're gonna read the first 41 verses. As I read it, I want you to notice how much time Luke spends talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Like this incredibly seminal event in the history of the world, certainly in the history of the Bible, a thousand years of prophecy. I want you to notice how much time Luke actually spends telling us about it. So read with me Acts chapter 2. We're going to read through verse 41. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, <laughs> they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you supposed. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You've made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, and he's no, that he was not abandoned to the realm of death, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. One of the greatest events in history, certainly in the scriptures, one of the most significant events ever, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Out of 41 verses in this section, how many does Peter spend on the Holy Spirit actually showing up? Four. Four verses on the Holy Spirit showing up. The Bible does this all the time. Two of the gospel writers don't even tell us about the birth of Jesus, and the other two each give us a verse. It was Mary's time. She gave birth to a boy. That's it? That's all you're going to tell us about the birth of the Messiah? The same thing? That's all you're going to tell us? For the first time ever in history, in thousands of years, God and men are no longer separated. God's goodness doesn't kill us. His spirit can dwell in us. Four verses. Because that's not what Luke is concerned about. Yes, it is incredibly significant. But that's not where he spends his time. Where he spends his time is how people respond to it. Four verses on the Spirit coming. Eight verses on how the people around respond to it. And then another 28 verses from Peter explaining how you should respond to it. What Luke wants us to know is what do we do with this? God has poured out his spirit on mankind. It's never happened before. It couldn't. It would have killed all of us. But after Jesus, it doesn't kill us anymore. God can dwell with people again. And what Luke wants us to know is what we do with that, why that matters. But you read the commentaries or you go online, or you watch the videos or the podcasts, and we completely flip this order. I mean, Luke spends 90% of his time on how should we respond to the coming of the Spirit, and 10% of his time on the Spirit coming. And we spend 90% of our time arguing about the Spirit coming. And what does it mean? Why are there tongues of fire? 
Why did they seem like tongues of fire? Does that mean it wasn't actually tongues of fire? It just looked like tongues of fire? What is it? Speaking in tongues, oh my goodness, what are we going to do with that? We spend, we spend all of our time on the freaky stuff. Winds and powers and speaking in other languages. And and again, you, you read the things and it's like this on the first four verses and like this on all the things that Luke wants us to pay attention to. God and people are not separated anymore. Now what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? When Luke writes these first four verses, what's interesting about it isn't what happens, it's how he writes it. For the people in the story, in the first four verses, They are always in the passive. That doesn't actually come out because of the way we write in English. But they were together, and they were sitting. And even in verse 3, we translate it, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. What he actually writes is, tongues of fire were seen by them. Where they say they began to speak in other tongues, it's not active. The people in this passage are always passive. They're receiving. And the spirit in this passage is always active. The person acting. In those first four verses, when Luke talks about the spirit coming, what he's talking about is that it is the spirit that is doing this. It's not the people. It has nothing to do with the people. The people have nothing. They don't act at all. They receive And then they do what the Spirit makes them to do and enables them to do. That's what Luke tells us at the beginning. But wow, brothers and sisters, churches have split over these four verses. So one of the things I love about pastoring a community church is our doctrinal statement's about that big. Okay? Baptist practice uh, the bat how does it go the baptist essentials in theology and faith is 48 pages if you're going to read the presbyterian church of america essentials in faith wow set aside an afternoon because i think it's about 150 pages long nothing wrong with that praise god that they have detailed how they feel about all these different things in scripture but we are a community church And what we hang on to is the essentials. Everybody's created in God's image. Everybody's fallen. The only way to heaven is Jesus because he died for us. He saved us. He rose again. He's defeated death. When you become a Christian, you get God's spirit, just like what Peter will say. What we hang on to is the essentials. And you have freedom in all the non-essentials. You have freedom to believe what you think the scriptures teach about all the other things. Our church does not have doctrine on speaking in tongues. Now I can tell you, there's people in our church who believe that speaking in tongues is over and doesn't happen anymore. That that was something specific that God did at this point in time in history, and it doesn't happen anymore. And they'll point to some scriptures that they would say make that case for them. And there's people in our church who are speaking in tongues during the service. When they're singing and they're praying, they're they're speaking in tongues. And they absolutely don't believe that tongues has ceased. It It is a part of their life today. And both those people, I mean, it's more than one, but both of those people are mature, godly people. And they disagree on this issue. Now, I confess I feel kind of bad being the one to talk to you about this because the charismatic gifts bounce off me. It is not for lack of trying or interest. Like, I do not believe they have ceased. I I, I absolutely think these gifts are still going on. I'm totally open to God doing something with me. Wow, God has not done anything with me. I had charismatic friends who who they, they were convinced that God wanted everyone to speak in tongues. And I don't, I don't speak in tongues. 
I mean, I could speak Latin or Greek at the time. I was in college. I was studying the classics, but that wasn't really what they were looking for, right? So they were like, no, Jeff, really. And we got together, and there's like three of them, and they laid hands on me, and I was sitting in the middle, and they, they prayed over me. At least I assume they did. It was all in tongues. I have no idea. It wasn't in Greek or Latin, which is the only two I would have known. So and they're all praying over me, and they pray, and they pray, and they're, they're passionate. And, and then one, they stop, and one of them says to me, now, Jeff, open your mouth and pray. And I opened my mouth, and I said, what do you want me to pray? <laughs> and they, yeah, they just. There's people in our church that, that don't think God does this anymore. I mean, obviously it happened. It's in the Bible. But there's people in our church that don't think it's, doesn't think it's happened anymore. And there's people in our church that actively practice it. And that works because we don't have doctrine on this. You are welcome to believe what you think the scriptures teach on things like speaking in tongues. Because what unites us is Jesus is Lord. And you must be willing to worship with people who disagree with you on that issue. If you don't think tongues is around anymore, you must be willing to worship next to someone who's speaking in tongues. Now, they're doing it exactly the way the scripture says. They're not disturbing the service. They're not drawing attention. I mean, the scriptures have a bunch of rules about how these gifts should be done in the service. And because these are mature, godly people, they're completely obeying all of that. They're, they're, they're not making an issue out of it at all. And the mature, godly people who don't think that happens anymore aren't running around saying, stop that, stop that, stop that. There are essentials we hold on to. And there are secondary issues that we say, wow, there's a lot of crazy stuff in the Bible. I'm not sure what to do with that. Again, why, why does it bounce off me? And other people, it's real and active. And, and I don't mean like, oh, there's a couple fringe people, right, who think that it doesn't happen. Or the, there, there's, been, there's been people on the elder board who don't think tongues is around, and there's been people on the elder board who speak in tongues. There are small group leaders who don't think tongues exists anymore, and there are small group leaders who speak in tongues. There have been members, staff members in our church who speak in tongues, and staff members in our church who don't think tongues as a gift exists anymore. And a few years ago, I was with a member of our church, a staff member of our church. We were trying to get the heat to turn on in a building, and we could not get it to turn on. So I prayed over it in English. It's the only language I got. Nothing happened. They prayed over it in tongues, and nothing happened. And the heat never came on until Jared got there and said, you know, you really ought to light the pilot light, morons. God can light a pilot light. I don't see why that was a problem, right? It just, you, you are so welcome to worship here and be like what Becky is talking about. Be part of this fellowship and what God is doing. Whatever you believe about the crazy stuff in the Bible, you just have to accept that God may be at work in ways, wow, that are a little uncomfortable sometimes. So let me, let me say to you, you know, I feel really bad as I was planning this sermon. It's just like, you know, Luke spends a tenth of his time on this, and I'm going to spend half of mine. Something's wrong here. But this is an issue. Churches have divided over this. Wow, folks, this is not, we're not going to divide over this issue. I mean, the resurrection of Christ, oh, yeah. You want to start teaching that Jesus didn't, didn't really come back to life? It's just a spiritual thing. It's like bunnies. It's, it's happiness. Oh, no, no, no. We will definitely split over that. Yeah, we're just not going to split over this. As long as you're okay saying Jesus is Lord. Not Jesus is Lord and you need to stop speaking in tongues. Not Jesus is Lord and you've got to speak in tongues. I'm not sure you're a Christian if you don't speak in tongues. Uh, no, no. No, we don't do any of that. Jesus is Lord. And sometimes Lord Jesus says, you know what? I want that person to have this gift. And sometimes Jesus is Lord says, that's not a gift for you. Because he decides. Jesus is Lord. And again, that's what Luke's saying in these first four verses. The people do nothing. They just receive. Even when he says they began to speak, he doesn't use an active verb. The active verb is the Spirit enabling them to speak. The people are just receiving. So, what does Luke want us to know about this passage? Why is this here? What, what's the big deal? Again, 90% of it is how do people respond? The first group of people, we're told, in 5 through 12, 
they are perplexed. Like, what's going on? How am I hearing? And again, we get into huge debates about what does this mean? Like, we're, does this mean that, you know, James was speaking in Phrygian and Bartholomew was speaking in Cappadocian and this guy was speaking in Parthian? Or does it mean they were all just speaking in tongues and ever, there's another miracle. God was enabling people to hear. We don't know. It, they're just say. How am I possibly hearing? One of these guys, you know, we're told, is from, from Parthia. That's not even part of the Roman Empire. That, that's, that's the Persian Empire that Alexander knocked out a few hundred years before this. That guy's never heard Parthian spoken in the Roman Empire before. They're the enemies of the Roman Empire. But this guy's hearing his own language. What's going on? They're perplexed. They're amazed. You hear the words Luke uses. They're bewildered, utterly amazed, amazed and perplexed. They ask each other, what's going on? A bunch of people respond to, again, what God is doing. It is all God. God does something, and a group of people respond to it with, what is that? What's going on? And then verse 13, you get the other reaction, which is mocking. One group responds to what God is doing with bewilderment and amazement, and one group responds to it with ridicule and mocking. And it's a lot stronger the way Luke writes it. Like, it doesn't come across it, but they actually use a specific kind of wine that is almost non-alcoholic. Like, it's so low. This is a slam. Right? This is like saying, oh, that guy, that guy is so bad with alcohol, he gets drunk on non-alcoholic beer. They are slamming them. They are accusing them of being just complete losers. And wow, you see that all the time when God is at work. You see that some people are interested and some people will mock you and belittle you and abuse you. And that is exactly what happens. I mean, you see it here. You, we'll see it all throughout the book of Acts. I'm sure you have seen it in your life if you've been a Christian for any length of time. God does something and some people are interested, and wow, some people are not. In fact, it's not just that they're like not interested, it's they're going to abuse you for it. They do not want you to be involved in this. They don't want to hear about this. They're going to mock you for it. And now, finally, in verse 14, somebody does something. Because up until now, none of the Christians have done anything. And this is the only thing any Christian ever does in this passage. In the biggest event, maybe, in the history of the world— the only thing that anyone does up until now, it's all God, any Christian does, is talk. Peter stands up with the 11 and says, let me explain this to you. Let me tell you what's going on. Yeah, I, I get it. You're not, let me tell you what's going on. And I love this, verse 15. These people aren't drunk. It's only nine in the morning. Right? Nobody could possibly get drunk on the kind of, like they'd have to start drinking at midnight to be drunk, at, at, to drink what you're saying they're drinking. Right? He has one sentence to the mockers and then he goes on. Doesn't argue with them, doesn't go down with them, doesn't, just one sentence to the mockers and then he moves on to the bewildered people. And all the rest of it is explaining to the bewildered people. And he's got some scriptures. He's like, guys, this is what God promised. Again, he's talking to Jews. We're, we're told that. This is a, Pentecost is a Jewish harvest festival. And we're told it was hugely popular. There's probably 70, 80,000 people live in Jerusalem at this time. You know, the Romans actually took some censuses. We have some idea. Uh, under 100,000 people. But during the festivals, it could go up to two or 300,000. A Jewish writer, now he's after Jesus, about 50 years after Jesus, he says in one of the Passovers, there was half a million people in Jerusalem for the festival. So this town of 80,000 just during these festivals. There's a lot of people in this city, but they're all Jewish. They're all celebrating this Jewish festival. And Peter said, quote scripture to him. It's like, no, this is exactly what God says. And then he tells him about Jesus. Quotes the scripture and then he tells him, hey, this is Jesus. This is, this is what happens. Then he quotes scripture again. Do you get that he's making a joke? He's quoting Psalm 16, which is David talking. And David is saying, everyone assumes David's talking about himself. David says, you will not abandon me to the realm of dead. You will not let me see decay. 
And then Peter says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died, was buried, and his decaying body is right there. He's kind of making a joke. I don't know if people laughed or not, but he's quoting this scripture where we all thought David was talking about himself. He's like, no, David's not talking about himself. David died. Of course David died. Everybody died. He's talking about the Messiah. The Messiah speaking through David. The only guy whose body never decayed was Jesus. Jesus that was killed 52 days ago and then rose from the dead 50 days ago. He tells him again. He tells him about Jesus. He tells, again, another quote from David. Therefore, here's his conclusion, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured. Let all Israel know for certain God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. And he's done. So I am in a preaching class this semester. I'm getting my M, my Master's in Divinity at Moody Theological Seminary online. I'm in a preaching class. This is actually my third preaching class. Um, wow. Peter turned this in for an assignment. Would not have gone well. Like he hasn't followed any of the rule. I mean, we have, there's a bunch of rules we're taught on how to preach I mean, I feel like I've, you know, again, it's my third class. I feel like I kind of figured out how this works and what. I'm pretty confident my professor, if Peter turned this in, he'd be like, that's a good first draft, Peter. It's a good, it's a good start. Um, ah, your scripture references are a little confusing. I don't think the joke works. I mean, you either need to lean into it or drop it. But you, you kind of go too fast with it. I, I suspect most people will miss what you're trying to do here. And wow. The place where Peter will fail is there's no application. He doesn't tell them to do anything. One of the things they drill into us in class is we're not trying to inform people. We're trying to transform people. We're not trying to just talk to people's minds. We're trying to talk to their hearts and their souls. You're you're using people's ears and minds as a way in to their inner life. But don't just educate people. What's Peter's conclusion? Know this, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Messiah. Okay, thank you very much. If Peter turned this sermon in for for the classes I have taken, it would not pass. It would come back. He would have to do it again. There's a bunch of things he has forgotten. There's a couple things he needs to take out. Like this, this, this would not work. Humanly, not a great sermon. What happens? Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what do we do? Peter preaches a pretty mediocre sermon. And 3,000 people become Christians. Why? Verses 1 through 4. Because it's God. It's not us. It's God. It's God. Because God is at work. Why did God choose Pentecost? Doesn't say. Why did he choose to have the Spirit sound like a freight train? Doesn't say. Why was the room filled with this noise and this wind? Doesn't say. Why are there tongues of fire? Why is this pillar of fire splitting and going on top? Doesn't say. Why does he have people speak in tongues? Doesn't say. Like nothing God did in any of that is explained. Most of it will never happen again, except for speaking in tongues. Nothing ever happens again in the book of Acts. We, we never have the sound of the freight train. We never have the huge wind that fills the house. We never see tongues of fire splitting out, uh, dividing out in the room. Like it's, None of this happens again. Speaking in tongues, we do see that again. About half the time in Acts that people become Christians, they'll speak in tongues. And about half the time they won't. That's not the point. The point is it's God. The point is God did this when God decided, where God decided, in the way God decided, how God decided to do it, and God did it. And wow, it worked. Peter opens his mouth, gives honestly a mediocre message, and thousands. What do we do? What What do we have to do? They're cut to the heart by what he said. So I did the math. 
I have preached somewhere between 400 and 420 sermons since I became pastor. It's my 13th year as the pastor of this church. Somewhere 400 to 420. I can count on one hand the number of people that I know of who've become Christians in, in my preaching. Praise God, anybody has. 3,000, one day. Why? God. Because God decides, because it's not us, because we don't decide, because it's not our skill, and it's not our technique, and it's not any of those things. Now, God does anoint people to do things. Sometimes it's just a one-off deal, and sometimes he does it permanently. But it's God. The only thing Peter does is open his mouth and speak. And God uses that for incredible, you are going to meet 3,000 people someday in eternity. You know, I don't know what we're going to do all that time, but I imagine some of it is, oh, how did you meet Jesus? Well, I was a Roman soldier on this campaign in Bithynia in 150 AD, right? Oh, I was living in this country called America. You've never heard of that. It's on the other side of the planet. You, you didn't find it for thousands of years. But right, how cool is that going to be? All these millions of people down through the ages finding out how God was gracious to us. You're going to meet people. How, how, how did you meet Jesus? He said, well, I, 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 I lived in Rome, but I, I came to, Ju to Jerusalem for this festival because my buddy said, oh, man, you gotta, you got to do this at least once in your life. It's unbelievable. And wow, the stuff that happened. It, like, God did this. It wasn't because Peter was such a great speaker. It wasn't because the believers had this great plan. They didn't. They're just sitting in a room. God was at work. Folks, remember what Becky said, right? Go out, share the gospel with someone. Wow, this ought to make it a lot easier. Stuff happens because God's at work. It happens when God is at work. It happens in the way God wants it to happen. All we do is open our mouth. All this week, I have been praying that this will happen to you this week. That at some point this week, God will do something that makes the people around you go, what? <laughs> what is that? What's going on with that? Okay, and probably it will make some people mock you. Do what Peter did. Ignore the mockers. Talk to the people who are interested. Open your mouth and tell them about Jesus. One of the greatest men in the history of church, the man upon whom Jesus said he would build the church, yeah, he doesn't do that great a job the first time through. And frankly, the whole repent and be baptized thing, Peter will never say that again. He will never add baptism. I mean, we'll hear him three or four more times in the book of Acts tell people how to become Christians. He will never include baptism again. I think because everyone was like, oh, how do you become a Christian? You believe in Jesus and you get baptized. You do these two things, you're saved. No, 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 no. No, the baptism is after you're saved. Okay, ba be baptized and you'll be saved. No, no, believe in Jesus. And then after you've believed, he'll never mention baptism again. But he mentioned it here, and there is an entire denomination that has split on this one verse. You must believe in Jesus, oh, and you must be baptized, even though you can find hundreds of verses in the scriptures which say that is not true. Peter didn't do it. This is not Peter's best work. It doesn't have to be your best work either. Just open your mouth. Just tell them about Jesus. Hey, try a joke. Peter did, I think. If it falls flat, that's okay. Right? Get, throw, throw some Bible verses out there. If it's a little confusing, it's all right. Just open your mouth. I am praying that God does this. Because they were sent, we are sent, we say it to you every time, you're going to go out into the world to this week. I'm praying that God does this for you. Something happens. Him. It's not you. It's not that you got to manufacture it. You don't need to be thinking in your mind right now, what could I do to make this happen? No, 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 no. He, he will make this happen. People will, will ask you about it. 
What is that? What do you think about that? What's going on? Yes, some people may make fun of you. Ignore them. Don't worry about them. Talk to the people who are interested and tell them about Jesus. And wow, if you don't do that great a job, that's okay. Neither did Peter. But 3,000 people became Christians because Peter opened his mouth. Sometime this week, God is going to do something. All you need to do is open your mouth. Just like those guys said to me, Jeff, open your mouth and pray. Okay, I can do that. I can open my mouth and pray. It may not come out the way you think. It may not work exactly like we're hoping. It may not line up with all of our expectations. That's so okay. What Luke is telling us in this passage is it's God. From the very beginning of the story all the way through, it is the power of God at work in these people's lives to save them because he wants them back. Sometime this week, something's going to happen. You need to open your mouth and tell them about Jesus and leave the rest of it to him. He made it happen and he will be at work. So let's pray. I'm going to pray for you. You pray for you. You pray that you will have the courage to open your mouth, that you will know what to say, that you won't be worried if it falls flat, or you tell a joke and nobody laughs, or you get your scriptures a little jumbled up sometimes. I'm going to pray for you, and you pray for you. And next week, I'm going to ask you about it. So make plans to be out of town if you're worried about it. It's like... Like, that's part of the sermon next week, because we're just going to do the rest of the chapter, which is the, it, it's le, the, the rest. You know, what Paul Harvey say? The rest of the story. We're going to do the rest of the story. Part of that will be us sharing, here's what God did, here's what happened, you know, which maybe is, yeah, I opened my mouth, everyone laughed, they walked away. I, that's on him. 3,000 people did not become Christians because Peter is such a fabulous evangelist. 3,000 people believed God because God cut them to the heart. And they knew they needed to turn to him. So let's pray. Uh, Jesus, thank you. Uh, Thank you that this is you. That the spirit comes when you will it in the way you want. And things happen as you determine. Uh, Thank you that that you cut people to the heart. Peter doesn't even call on them to repent. He doesn't call on them to believe. He doesn't call on them to do anything. He just tells them, hey, you killed the Messiah. And yet you... We're at work in that. Oh, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that you will be at work in us this week. That your spirit, just like you did that day, all those years ago in Pentecost, your spirit will do something that brings people running. Your spirit will do something that amazes people, that makes people turn to us and say, what does this mean? Like, what is this? What's going on? And then, Jesus, give us the courage to open our mouths. Give us the courage to do what Peter did, to stand up and try and explain it. Uh, Lord, you know how self-conscious we are. You know we don't want to look stupid. You know we don't want to embarrass you. You know we want to do a good job of representing you. Help us to get past all that and to trust you, that you are at work, that you will work in the hearts of whom you will work, just like Peter said, This is for everyone whom the Lord will call. That when you are at work in people, then it's not about how great our message is. It's about how great you are. And and again, Peter doesn't even ever get around to telling them how to be saved until they ask him. It's not about us, it's about you. It's about you at work in people's lives. Jesus, give us the courage and the confidence to open our mouths this week because you are gracious and you are generous and you don't want anyone to perish. If it were up to you, everyone would turn to you and be saved. Thank you. Thank you that you are kind and you are merciful. Thank you for your great mercy on all of these men and women who many had traveled for probably months to come to this festival. And wow, they didn't just get a great party. They got you. They met the Lord. They met the Messiah. Their lives were transformed, just like Becky's life was transformed because her roommate spoke to her. Thank you. Lord, we pray these things 
for us because we need you to be at work in us. And we pray them for your glory and your goodness because there's a lot of people in this city that need to hear about you. So many people in this city that need to know that there is a kind and a good and a gracious God who wants them back, that their lives matter and they are loved more than they could ever imagine. Jesus, give us courage and confidence when the moment is right, when you are at work, to open our mouths. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's close this time as we always do. It's take communion together. There are stations in all four corners. If you remember, Jesus told us when we get together to do this. So we remember. Again, it's not us. (laughs) It's not us that saves anybody. It's not us that saved anybody 2,000 years ago on the cross, and it's not us that saves anybody today. We just open our mouths and tell people. He decides who responds. There were way more than 3,000 people in the city that day. But this is what he decided. These are the people that he called. So I'm going to pray for us again. When I'm done praying, get up and go to whichever station you want. There's also gluten-free down here to my right if you need that. Get the cup, get the bread, bring it back to your seat. I'll lead us and we'll take it together. So pray with me again, please. I thank you, Jesus. I mean, none of this is possible. Everything that happens, God can pour out his spirit on us and not kill us because you have taken our sins. And David is right. Although it seems at the time you were speaking through him, but in the end, you will not leave our bodies in the grave. You, Jesus, you have conquered death. Death couldn't hold you and it won't hold us. Thank you. Everything Peter says is only because of what you have done. Thank you. We remember, Lord, that's what you told us to do. Take the bread, take the cup and remember. And so we do that again today. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will remind us. You'll remind us now, and you'll keep reminding us all week that this is all about you. This is you at work. And because you love to bring your kids to work with you, you use us. We open our mouths and tell people about you, and you are at work in them. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. These are the words of Paul the Apostle to the church in Corinth. What I receive from the Lord is what I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this and remember me. Brothers and sisters, let's take the bread and remember our Lord. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it and remember me. Let's take the cup and remember our Lord. For whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. If you'll put the cup in the little slot in the seat in front of you so we can pick them up later. While you're doing that, pray with me one more time. Thank you, Lord. We always say that here and we always will. Thank you. You did not have to do this. We ran away from you and you could have waited for us to come back. That would have been just. But you knew we never would. And so you chased us. And I think about that song we sing that your goodness is running after me. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters, for anyone who is fleeing your goodness, that they would stop and let you catch them. Because your goodness can be with us again now. It won't kill us like it would have killed Moses. Your goodness can surround us and envelop us and transform us. So Lord, now we pray, accept this worship from your grateful people. We pray in your name. Amen. Stand with me. Let's sing again. Spirit.
Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in
Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness, God. You are so good, we can't comprehend it. You are so good, it could destroy us because we are so wicked. But you bridge the gap, Lord, you bridge the gap. You met us, Lord, and you gave us your spirit. Thank you, thank you for your spirit, Lord. I pray for the courage for us to open our mouths this week, Lord, because your goodness is so good. Even if what comes out is befumbled and a mess, you use it. You use it, Lord, because you are good. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dunwoody Community Church, you are sent. Have a wonderful week.